We're starting a new series uh, this morning, and this series is really emphasizing that last song, the wonderful love of Jesus. We're going to see the wonderful love of Jesus uh, in this series. What this is uh, that I want us to see is I want us to see the last earthly life of, of Jesus day by day. And so today we're looking at uh, the Sunday before the resurrection and the events that happened as recorded there in, uh, in Mark uh, chapter 11, 1 through 11. Now we're going to focus... Um, in uh, in Mark, we could uh, we could look at the other gospels as well, and we'll bring them in occasionally. But I want to focus in Mark. Uh, in fact, um, Mark is is a short gospel. You look, it just has sixteen chapters, and yet the events and the things leading up to the death of Jesus uh, are five chapters: chapters eleven through fifteen, and then chapter sixteen is the resurrection. So that's a, if you look at the proportion of that, that's a large proportion of the gospel that's devoted to the death and the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, uh, several commentators have noted and have said that uh, Mark's gospel is a passion narrative or talking about the suffering of Jesus with a long introduction. And so that's, we're going to focus on, on Mark. Um, there is a book that I'm, I'm rereading now. It's by um, the authors Borg and Croissant. They're not exactly conservative biblical scholars, but they have some interesting things to say. In fact, the, the, the title of the book is The Last Week of Jesus. And uh, they emphasize that Mark went out of his way to chronicle Jesus last week in such a very detailed uh, way. It's day by day basis. Now, you look at all the, the other gospel writers, Matthew and Luke and John, and they mention some of these indications of time, but uh, they, don't do, they don't mention it like Mark does, and very precise. In fact, uh, just uh, if you have your Bibles open there to Mark, we're going to be reading some verses. In 11.1 1, that we heard, notice the time there, the chronology, as they approached Jerusalem, at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. That's Sunday. That's, that's the Sunday before the resurrection. That's the day that we're looking at here. Then look at uh, Mark 11 and verse 12 on the next day. So that's the next day. That's Monday. When they had left Bethany, he became hungry. So that's next week. And then uh, look over at verse 20 of Mark 11 as they were passing by in the morning. So that's the next day. That's Tuesday of this week. And these are using our day, the, the names that we give our days. They didn't have those names back then. Uh, look at Mark 14 and verse 1. Now the Passover and festival of, festival of unleavened bread were two days away, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him covertly and kill him. And so that's Wednesday. Passover is two days away, so Wednesday. Uh, look at um, Mark 14 and verse 12. <clears throat> On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? So Mark 14, 12 is describing the Thursday. Mark 15, verse 1. Early in the morning, the chief priest with the elders, scribes, entire council immediately held a consultation. They bound Jesus, led him away, and turned him over to Pilate. That's Friday of this week. And uh, then go here in Mark 15, verse 42, as we're up to Saturday. 42 says when evening had come since it was the preparation day that is the day before the sabbath and then you look at 16 1 when the sabbath was over mary magdalene mary the mother of james and salome <coughs> brought spices so that they might come and anoint him and then finally look at 16 2 and very early on the first day of the week they came to the tomb that's sunday so what Mark is doing is he is going day by day in this last week of Jesus. 
and it's he's making certain that we know when those things happen now not only does he do the day by day but he also does morning and evening back up to chapter 11 in mark in verse 1 says as they approached bethany at bethphage near the mount of olives he sent two of his disciples so <clears throat> this i think I've, i'm dealing with that same pollen that everybody else is so it's it's the the morning when he sends these out and then look at verse 11 Jesus entered Jerusalem, came into the temple area. After looking around and everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve since it was already late. It's, it's the evening of that day, evening of Sunday. Um, Mark 11, verse 12, on the next day, so that's going to be the morning, and then verse 19, and whenever evening came, they would leave the city. And then in Mark 14 and verse 12, on the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, the disciples said, where do you want us to go and prepare to eat the Passover? And then verse 17 says, when it was evening, he came with the 12. So he, he breaks each day down. So next day, next day, next day. Then not only that, in, in a couple of these, he says morning and evening, morning and evening. And on the, the last day, or the day before the resurrection, he, he breaks down, or the day of the crucifixion on Friday, he breaks this down into three-hour intervals. Go uh, to Mark 15 and verse 1, early in the morning. And he's using Roman time. It's almost like, these are Roman military watch times, three hours. So early in the morning, 6 a.m., look at 1525. Now it was the third hour when they crucified him. That's 9 a.m., so from 6 to 9. Then 1533, when the sixth hour came, Darkness fell on the whole land until the ninth hour. So the sixth hour is 12 o'clock noon. And then 1534 at the ninth hour, that's 3 o'clock uh, p.m. So he is, all this is showing 1542, six, I didn't mention that, but 1542 is 6 p.m. So when evening had come. But all this is showing, I mean, why so detailed? So that Mark's readers can follow the events of the last week of Jesus day by day, but also hour by hour. Now, the main event of this first day in this, in this last week is the triumphal entry, and that's what we're going to look today. Now, we heard uh, Kent read from Mark chapter 11, and that's where we're going to base our thoughts, but we need to really hear the other gospels in this because all four gospels mention this so go if you will now to matthew chapter 21 matthew chapter 21 and we'll read one through nine when they had approached jerusalem and had come to bethphage at the mount of olives jesus then sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with it. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them on immediately. Now, this took place so that what was spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their cloaks on them and he sat on the cloaks. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. Now the crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So 
Matthew mentions this event, and Matthew makes sure, as he does throughout his gospel, to show that Jesus fulfills prophecy, and he even cites the prophecy. And that's an important prophecy, as Zechariah 9 and verse 9. We'll talk more about that um, later on in the few minutes we have. But um, one thing, notice that uh, he goes to, or he sends them to go get the donkey in verse 7, uh, and brought the donkey and the colt, and laid their cloaks on them. So that's donkey and the cloak, or the colt. And he sat on the cloaks. Now is he riding the donkey and, and the colt at the same time? Mark doesn't give us that picture. Um, I don't really see how you know you could do that to ride both of them at the, at the same time. Probably the picture is he's riding the donkey and he's leading the colt of the donkey um, behind him. And what this is showing him is emphasizing, as you know, that he's coming in humility. He's coming not as a, as, a, as a warrior king, but he's coming as a humble king. And so not only just the donkey, but even the, the colt of the donkey he leads. All right, let's go over to uh, Luke chapter 19. It's a little bit longer section there, but we really need to hear it. Luke chapter 19, and it's on the screen there if you um, missed it. Luke 19, and we'll read 28 through 40. After Jesus said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he approached Bethphage and Bethany near the mountain that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, Go into the village ahead of you there. As you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it, bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent left and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and they threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. Now as he was going, they were spreading their cloaks on the road. And as soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And yet some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Jesus replied, I tell you, if these stop speaking, the stones will cry out. Now let's go over to John and hear his, uh, his record of this. And that's in John chapter 12. And something very interesting and very significant happened in John chapter 11. And that's the raising of, by Jesus of a dead man. And his name is Lazarus. And that's spread all around. Everybody knows that. And the religious leaders are so angry at that. That that's about the last they're going to put Jesus to death. All right, John 12, and we'll begin reading verse 12. On the next day, when the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, indeed the King of Israel. Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, Do not fear, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. These things his disciples did not understand at the first. That's interesting, isn't it? What did they not understand about this? They did not understand at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things for him. So the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify about him. For this reason also the people went to meet him because they heard that he had performed this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are not accomplishing anything. Look, the whole world has gone after him. All right, let's go back uh, to Mark chapter 11, and that's where we're going to continue to focus our, our thoughts. Mark 11, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 11. Now, it's not possible, I don't think, to, uh, with certainty, to establish from all four Gospels 
how all these things kind of fit together, the exact sequence. Uh, one person wrote uh, in, in Luke's gospel, uh, Jesus breaks into tears um, at seeing Jerusalem in this uh, entry parade. Uh, here in Mark's gospel, he uh, no sooner enters the city. I mean, Matthew and Luke present it that he goes in and when he comes in the triumphal entry, he goes to the temple and he cleanses the temple. But here in Mark, you have Jesus enters the city and as soon as he gets in the city, he goes to the temple and he looks and he leaves. And in the words of this person, when Jesus comes back into the city the next day, he does so without fanfare. But he does come in with fire as he curses a fig tree and cleanses the temple courts. And so it's, uh, this person said, it's easy to preach about this to make it look it's just a straightforward set of events and the apostles know everything's happening. Look, it's finally here. This is it. But the, it seems the apostles don't really know what all's going on here. Um, there is uh, another structural point here in 1 through 11. Notice Mark spends, I mean, you just have 11 verses here. Or really 10 if you, you, know, you don't count verse 11 when it talks about he goes back out of the city. So he spends more than half of this section detailing how all this, all this strange thing about how Jesus gets this donkey. I mean, he sends people and he said when they ask you about it and then you tell them that, and he brings the donkey. That's a lot of verses in a very short gospel to talk about how Jesus is getting this donkey. Um, it's almost like we think, why all the emphasis on this? Well, the answer again is anybody familiar with Zechariah would immediately know why so much space is spent on this because Zechariah 9, 9, your king is coming, seated on a donkey. And again, we're going to talk more about Zechariah 9 in a few minutes. A final structural point here in Mark. Look at uh, the Mark chapter, uh, th that should be uh, Mark 10 instead of Mark 15 on the screen. Seems like it's always always one mistake hidden in the, in the slides. But look at Mark 10, and this is about Bartimaeus, who's a blind man, and Bartimaeus is crying out, verse 47, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Bartimaeus is blind, but he sees, and he sees better than the religious leaders who ought to see, they can physically see, but they don't see because they're blind. They don't see that Jesus is the son of David. And so in a sense, uh, this is played out in the triumphal entry in the next chapter, in chapter 11. So chapter 11. 1 through 6, again, talks about that getting that donkey. Jesus is coming with his disciples from Jericho. That's about 18 miles away. Now, remember, we're talking about walking everywhere. So, 18 miles away, Bethany is on the slope of the Mount of Olives, uh, about two miles from Jerusalem. And if you remember from the Gospels, Bethany is the home of some dear friends of Jesus, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And Lazarus has died, and Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And that's back in John chapter 11. Uh, we don't know where Bethphage is uh, exactly, but it's in that general vicinity probably. Uh, the Mount of Olives is a ridge that overlooks Jerusalem. And in Zechariah chapter 14, there's a strange prophecy, and it talks about, uh, it associates the coming of the Messiah with Mount of Olives. So he gives instruction to his disciples and he said, go into this village that's opposite you and find this young, this young donkey. Uh, uh, the Greek word here can be a colt or of a donkey or of a horse, but Matthew tells us that it's a donkey and a colt. So go find this, this donkey. And again, Zechariah 9.9, 9, your king is coming lowly and riding on a donkey. So this young donkey will be tied on which no one has ever ridden. 
No one's ever has sat on this. An idea maybe this is a special mount. Uh, it's, it's never used by another person. You remember the tomb that they use to bury Jesus? It says that it's a tomb where no one has been laid. And so here's a donkey. Nobody's ridden this donkey. Here's the tomb. No one has been laid in this. Also, this may be related to the Jewish work, the Mishnah, which forbids others to ride on the king's donkey. It's the king's donkey. You don't, you know, no one just jumps on that. Um, and kings did ride donkeys when they came in, in peacetime. Uh, numbers, uh, we're not going to go and read that, but Numbers 19 and verse 2 in Deuteronomy 21, 3 requires that animals that had never borne a, a, a yoke were to be used for sacrifice. So the, the principle is uh, animals that are used for sacred purposes are not used for ordinary purposes. Here's a donkey. Nobody's been riding on this donkey, and it is for the king. It's for a sacred person. And he says, you go, you find in this village, you untie him and, and bring him. One writer said, that's pretty bold. That's, that's like looking for a car that has keys in the ignition and then driving away with it. And you got, I mean, somebody's going to say something. And the disciples could be punished for taking a, a, a colt without authorization. And they're willing to do this. They don't understand everything that's going on here, but so it's a mark of, of faith. And he says, if anyone asks you, what are you doing? Their answer is to be, the Lord needs it. Now, we don't know whether Jesus is exercising his um, godly power of sovereignty and he knows and he how this is going to work out um, and, and I don't have a problem with that and I kind of lean toward that view or it may be he had he worked this out beforehand uh, with these people but I would probably lean that he is God, he is God he is sovereign and this whole thing but I mean look at these details isn't this strange go find a donkey in this village and it'll be tied up and you take it and when somebody says what are you doing you say the Lord needs this. And that's exactly what happens. And then they walk away with the donkey. So they went, they found the young donkey. And the fact that it's it's repeated here, I mean, it's it's a very it's not highly interesting reading if you're trying to, you know, drama trying to grip you. So why is all this in such detail here? Again, it's emphasizing the donkey that he's going to be riding on this donkey. Um and the people say, or they don't say anything. They just take the donkey away. So perhaps God has prepared them for, for that moment. Now, one thing that stands out to me, and uh, I read a couple of commentaries and studies and sermons, and they said, you know, uh, why is a sermon focusing on the donkey here? And Well, Mark does. He gives a lot of emphasis to it. So what, what is this? And, and uh, one person suggests this, and I thought it was very good. It said that the Lord had asked for something and it is a donkey, just a, just a donkey that perhaps seemed to be so insignificant for any use in God's kingdom. God needs this donkey. But Jesus, that it turned out not to be the case. This is something that is significant. It's important. And he used this donkey for his entrance into Jerusalem. And so, whatever modest gifts we have, they can be used by God beyond what we can even anticipate. So, go get the donkey, bring it back here. And they do. Then look at 7 through 10. They brought the donkey back, or the colt, put their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. <coughs> It's never been ridden before, so this is like a saddle. And he sat on it. And that's unusual because all throughout the Gospels, Jesus is walking everywhere. And in fact, when pilgrims came close to Jerusalem during times of feast, like Passover, they would, if they rode for a long ways, they'd get off whatever they're riding and, and walk in. And yet Jesus... Walk, rides in, mounted on this donkey. 
that's it's significant. It's it's a dramatic way that he is entering Jerusalem. As we said, kings would ride this way. Now, kings would ride a horse into battle, but a donkey when they came in peace. And they spread their garments out as he's going into the, the city. It's, it's like rolling out the red carpet for the king. And there are other passages in, in uh, 2 Kings 9, 13. Jehu is, uh, is king, and it talks about they spread their cloaks out before him and cried out, Jehu, Jehu is king. And they cry out, Hosanna. They go before and they cry out, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is a Hebrew word, Hosanna. And it has the, the root of the word for save or salvation. And the na is now or please. So save us please or save us now. Now sometimes it, it came to be used. People would use it as, as a word of praise in much the same way that, that uh, people use the word hallelujah now. I mean if somebody says, you know, God has done this and somebody will say hallelujah. But um, they're, so they're praising God in this. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's a quotation from Psalm 118. It's a praise psalm. This is an enacted dramatic event. The king is riding in Jerusalem on a donkey, lowly, and they praise God because the one who is coming in the name of the Lord and in the kingdom of our father David. And they have to be careful here because this is a fine line. Passover time was highly charged. And the Romans controlled the Jewish people this time. They controlled the land. And I'll, I'll talk more about this in just a minute. But there was all, at any time, um, a revolt could just, it, it could just you know, start. And the Romans knew that. And there are soldiers stationed all around. So you start talking about a king, another king, then that's, you know, that's, that's, that's dangerous. But they say he is the kingdom of our father David. Now, why would they cry out? And you probably thought this and you've heard this before. This crowd crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then a few days later, the crowd is crying out, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Well, one possibility is that they're fickle, that, and that's the nature of, of people and the nature of, of crowds. And I don't have a problem with that, and it shows you know, how easily people are swayed. It could also be that this is the crowd who were, they were with Jesus when Lazarus was raised. They're his disciples. And I don't, it's not a big fanfare in the sense that the whole city would know this. There's a lot of people in Jerusalem. So these are his lowly disciples as they come in. And then later, that's a different crowd. And that crowd is crying out, crucify. So I don't have a problem that the crowd might change, and that's, that, can hap that happens with humans. I don't have a problem that these are the ones who were with him when he raised Lazarus, and the others, that's a different crowd. But they're crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now the last verse here that I want us to look at in this first day of the last week of Jesus is verse 11. Jesus entered Jerusalem, came into the temple area, and after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve since it was already late. That's, that's almost anticlimactic, but we can understand this because he has walked from Jericho, that's about 20 miles, and it's uphill because you go up to Jerusalem. And so in the temple, there's no crowd. There's no greeting from the priest. There's the honor that he was given and when he came into Jerusalem, it's not there in the temple area. And it, as I said, it's almost anticlimactic, but it's, it's an inspection tour. And the next day he's coming back, and we'll see that next week. He's going to come back and cleanse the temple. And so he goes back to Bethany, he has friends there, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, 
and it, it's more comfortable. There's a lot of people in Jerusalem at this time. Uh, it's, it's difficult to know the population of ancient cities, but Jerusalem probably had a population around 40,000 in the time of Jesus. But in feast days, there would be over 200,000 pilgrims who would come. So you go from 40,000 to about 240 or 250,000 people in Jerusalem. And there's people camping all over the, the hills and everything. So he's going to cleanse the temple in the next day. Now, what I want us to do for a minute here, what is the meaning of this event, this triumphal entry? The book I mentioned, Borg and Croissant, they suggest there were two processions into Jerusalem. And let me read a little bit of what they say. Two processions entered Jerusalem on a spring day in the year 30. It was the beginning of the week of Passover, the most sacred week of the Jewish year. One was a peasant procession, the other an imperial procession. From the east, Jesus rode a donkey down the Mount of Olives, cheered by his followers. His followers came from lower class. They're not upper class. On the opposite side of the city... From the west, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, entered Jerusalem at the head of a column of soldiers and cavalry. Jesus' procession proclaimed the kingdom of God. Pilate's procession proclaimed the power of empire. Pilate's military procession was a demonstration of, of Roman power, imperial power, but also Roman theology. Though unfamiliar to most people today, the imperial procession was well known in the first century. Mark and his readers would have known about this. The, the Roman governors, I'm paraphrasing some of this, but the Roman governors didn't live in Jerusalem. They lived over by the sea in a place called Caesarea. It's like a resort place. And a real nice palace and everything. I mean, living on the sea, sea coast right there. But they would come to Jerusalem during feast times. Why would they come? Out of reverence for Jewish people? No. Because they're afraid something's going to happen. And the Roman governors wanted to be there. Uh, especially Passover. Because Passover celebrates when the Jewish people were delivered by God from Egyptian slavery. And so with Passover, with all those thoughts, the Roman governors would be right there in Jerusalem. And the mission of the troops was to in, reinforce the Roman garrison that's there. Imagine the imperial procession into the city. Of Calvary on horses, foot soldiers, leather, armor, helmets, weapons, banners, golden eagles mounted on poles, sun shining on metal and gold, the sounds, the marching of feet, the creaking of leather, the clinking of bridles, the beating of drums, the swirling of dust, the eyes of the silent onlookers, some curious, some awed, some angry and resentful. Pilate's procession is showing power as he comes into Jerusalem. Nothing's going to happen while I'm here as governor with all these soldiers. That's what he's saying. It shows also Roman theology because the Roman emperors were not just rulers. The Roman emperors were thought in, in their own minds and the people to be sons of God, a son of God. And it began with Augustus and uh, Tiberius, the emperor in the time of Jesus. Uh, he, he wanted that as well. So here is Jesus, here is Pilate. So back to Jesus' procession as he rides into Jerusalem. It's clear because it, it uses the symbolism of Zechariah 9, 9 and 10. Now, I want to read uh, Zechariah 9, 9 and 10. Verse 9 is the verse that applies to the triumphal entry. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Then the next verse tells what kind of king he is. I will eliminate the chariot from Ephraim, the horse from Jerusalem, the bow of war will be eliminated, and he will speak peace to the nations. And his dominion will be from sea to sea.
from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. He will banish war from the land because he is a king of peace. Triumphal entries were not like that. They were like Pilate coming in in power. Yet Jesus comes in as king of peace. That's the meaning, Zechariah 9, 9, and 10. 744 is our invitation song, and it's appropriate title, What Will Your Answer Be? What's your answer to this king of peace? Who dies for our sins. And we're going to see that in detail in the coming weeks. But he died not for his own sins. He died for our sins, and he came to bring peace. That's peace with God. This morning, if you're not a Christian, what will your answer be to him? Are you going to follow this king of peace as you turn from yourself and from your sins, confess his name, and you're baptized, you're immersed, and you become his follower, shouting out, Hosanna, the Lord has come. If you've done that and you're, you're living in sin, uh, then you're almost like that fickle crowd. You've gone from praise to to crucify him and so the good news is we have time this morning we have opportunity this morning to to uh, be right with God and it's our prayer if you need to come you'll do that while we stand while we sing